Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of The Happiness Retreat. I am your host, Kimberly Trebs, and today we have the good fortune to be in conversation with my dear friend and colleague, the fabulous and multi-talented Tony Sicardi, who is an internationally certified emotional intelligence coach, a mindfulness at work trainer, and a leader of industry leaders to help them understand and apply the science of emotional and social intelligence so they can create a culture within their company of trust. Tony's training and coaching is entirely practical and evidence-based and brings a refreshing and agnostic and nonsensical view of meditation to his clients in a practical way in which they build resiliency. Wow, that was the most difficult part of this interview. <laughs> Hello, Tony, and thank you very much for taking your time to share with us today. Thanks, Kimberly. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm so glad to be here. <laughs> you are so welcome. So, Tony, please tell us, um, as this conversation is all about spirituality and the soul and becoming the master of your own energy, can you please share with us how emotional intelligence and mindfulness are vehicles for transformation? And can you start, please, by giving us a little bit about your background and education and what prompted you to become interested in emotional intelligence and mindfulness? Yeah, so absolutely. Background education, uh, I've, been, I've been in IT like you, I imagine, right? In uh, information technology for a really, really long time. I spent more than 25 years working for large corporations in, in the IT department. And uh, I love my job. Uh, I was in the flow most of the time. I was wondering why I was being paid so much for uh, fixing problems, which to me were like crossword puzzles. It was fun <laughs> and um, it, it was good. It was really cool. Uh, and, uh, but at some point, like five years ago, uh, I felt like things were changing a little bit. It was a little bit different. I was not having as much fun. I was uh, sleeping less. Having kids doesn't help with sleep. I was sleeping less, but it was not because of the kids. Really. It was because I was getting more and more to do at work. We were doing more and more and uh, with less, more with less all the time. That was mm -hmm. kind of like the, the new mantra, do more with less. But with less sleep, uh, I got less focus, attention, and then I started to get overwhelmed, too much to do. And I was too proud, I guess, to, to cry uncle. And uh, I accepted more tasks and I tried to continue and then I got really overwhelmed. And then it started to go downhill. I was not really myself at work. I felt like I was failing at uh, things that I should not, not have failed. I felt like I was a little bit like a zombie, you know, the, mm. the, the, when you, you go to work and you're so tired that you fall asleep at your seven o'clock in the morning meeting. <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> <laughs> and you keep staying there like until, you know, seven in the evening. And, and what have you done during the day except trying not to fall asleep? I was questioning really my, what, what I was doing at some point. Not just me, but also my boss was questioning what I was doing. <laughs> and uh, I got to that place where it felt like, hmm, this is not good. <laughs> <laughs> and um, fortunately for me at the time, that's when I discovered uh, mindfulness. I guess the, 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 the silver lining for me was that I got in, I got in such a bad uh, place mm -hmm. that I felt something is really wrong and I need to, to go back to the roots. The roots for me were going back to, to the place where I felt I, uh, something changed in my life. A long time ago, when I was in my early 20s, I traveled to India. And uh, that was my first uh, big travel. I went to different places, met a lot of different people, uh, went to all the different sacred places, north in the Himalaya and also south, going to Sri Lanka and so on. Learned so much and, uh, and I felt that changed my life. It changed the, the, the person I was. Part of it was uh, what we call mindfulness today. Uh, learning how to harness your mind and think mm -hmm. about something greater than yourself and be of service to that greater thing. 
And then, you know, forward like, you know, 20 years, 30 years, and here I am with a mortgage payment, two kids, a job, and uh, insurances and so on, and, and, and not living the life I signed up for, living a totally different life. You know, one thing leads to another, and then you're a different person. So that was a wake up call for me. And the wake up call was saying, hey, who are you? What are you doing? <laughs> and, and that's how uh, I thought, okay, the last thing in my life that really made a difference for me was mindfulness, the way we talk about it today. So mm -hmm. let me try that again. And um, two things happened in my life at, the, at, at that moment. One was I was not too keen on meditation itself. I thought of mindfulness as in the moment, like being present in the moment, focusing on the things you're doing. But meditation, sitting down, doing nothing, nah, not my thing. But one day I came back from, from, uh, from work in my house. And what do I see in my living room? A couple of Buddhist monks who had traveled all the way from Thailand to come here. Uh, because my wife was working with them. She had gone to Thailand. Her, her father's an archaeologist, long story short, but she went there to help them um, uh, finding some, uh, some uh, scrolls and so on. There was a whole story going on. And um, they put to, to thank her. They came here. They were coming here for other reasons as well. They came to our house to thank her and, 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 and uh, deliver a gift to her. And as part of the gift, it was also they would run a meditation in my own house. So here I was in my own house. I had no choice but to sit down and, and meditate with, uh, with those monks who had traveled from, from that far away. And uh, it was actually a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I came back to work and a couple of weeks later, I had volunteered for the for the wellness center at at work. I wanted to help them. I didn't know with what, but they they asked me uh, a few weeks after. Well, uh, how about meditation? We've tried that before. It didn't quite work. Would you like to to help us uh, try to 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 uh, to schedule meditation meetings here at the workplace? And I said, Oh, sure. I'm a I'm an expert. I have monks, you know, coming to my house. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't quite say that, but I said, yeah, sure, I'm going to try to, I'm, I'm going to help with that. I felt like that was kind of a, you know, sometimes you have the feeling those little signs are coming to you. Yes. It may be true, it may not be true, but it feels like, you know, you feel the significance and the importance of the moment mm -hmm. that, that some, some kind of window or door is opening uh, before you. And uh, so I decided, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a shot. I'm going to try. And I started that, and when I started, it was very simple. I would uh, go to YouTube and find uh, free um, videos of people uh, gui of guided meditation. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I made a whole list of them and so on. And I would schedule meetings. So schedule meetings and, uh, and, and make sure that was on our in, uh, website for the company that everybody would know that there were meetings on meditation twice a week at the same time on, the, on the Monday and, uh, and Friday, and they could come, it would always be there. At first, when I was doing this, I was the only person. I was the only one in the room meditating. And, uh, and then little by little, there was one more person, then two, then three. And then very soon we had like rooms that were almost full. So it, it, really, it really changed. Wow. And, um, and I could see the impact on, on myself. To, to do those guided meditations and uh, the impact it had on other people, I, I could feel like the, not just the stress melting away, but uh, beca becoming good stress instead of bad yeah. stress. Like, yeah. you know, feeling like, now I, I feel like I have some kind of a purpose. I know what I am about. I, I was feeling more about, my, about myself, self-inquiry meditations. Also, I was trying different kinds of meditation, not just the breathing meditation, but mm -hmm. body scan, uh, self-inquiry and so on. And, and, and all of that was, moving stuff inside that helped me to figure out the outside. This is when um, I uh, decided, okay, there's something to it. I want to know more. And, uh, and the way I function is that when I, I have an interest in something, I want to become very good at it. I want to learn about it. So I started to search um, on the internet for uh, courses on meditation. And that's how I found uh, Sarah Macklin, which you know. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And because uh, we met there. <laughs> yes, we did. We uh, took her class together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and I found out that she was giving that course on meditation. And and I have found like you know courses that we are varying from. Uh, you give someone four hundred dollars, watch two videos, and they give you a certification. Right. What is that out there? <laughs> and uh, to uh, some, like you have to sign up the rest of your life and go on a mastery or something and never come back. Right. To something in the middle, and th- that was Sarah, something in the middle <laughs> that would work for me, where, um, you know, six months of training followed by uh, uh, eight days intensive and then coming back with a certification. And that made sense to me. So I did that. Uh, and uh, it lasted about nine months of uh, studying and then mm-hmm. going to the intensive. And when I came back, uh, I thought, okay, now I can do it. I am the teacher and I don't have to, to have those guided meditation. I'm going to run myself those meditations. I started doing that. And then uh, soon after, someone told me, hey, do you realize what you're doing here? Uh, yeah, I'm teaching meditation. You cannot do that. You're an employee. You're not allowed to do that. <sighs> so I uh, was so okay, no, 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 no. <laughs> was not too happy about it, but okay, that's the way the rules are the rules. So we're going to mm-hmm. go by the rules. So what I did, I was not able to directly uh, teach meditation, but I was able to create a mindfulness program, which is what I did. So I created like a nine, nine weeks uh, mindfulness program and each week we'd learn something new uh, from the simple breath awareness, body scan, all the way to chakras and yoga nidra, open mm-hmm. awareness, mm-hmm. lots of cool stuff. And each week was like uh, introducing the technique. And then we would have questions and answers and I would answer most of the questions. And then we had the guided meditation for which I would go back again to YouTube and guided meditations from other people because I was not able to do it myself. Right. I was not allowed to do it myself. And, uh, and that was fabulous. I felt like as I was doing that, I felt good. Um, mm-hmm. I had like, I was really talking with people who, who cared about who they were, where they were going and who had genuine questions about what was going on in their life and, and what they wanted to achieve. And it felt really good to participate in that. And I felt that's what I'm missing. Uh, all those last years, like 25 years plus, I was mostly talking to, uh, to the screen in front of me, <laughs> doing my crossword puzzles or what, you know, coding, whatever. And uh, right. to project managers who wanted, you know, to give me more tasks and so on and, and trying to influence other people to do the things they need to do for the project and so on. Some of it was cool, and, and, but it was missing that personal touch or mm-hmm. that deeper connection with people. And when you spend like, you know, 10, 12 hours a day at work, that's where you spend your time with people and, and, and where you have your, your connections. Right. And, and if those connections are, are superficial, you yourself feel like a superficial being. And mm-hmm. I didn't realize that, but that's what I was really, really missing. A deeper connection with myself, which I went back to with the meditation, the mindfulness, but especially a deeper connection with people. And, uh, and as I was doing that uh, mindfulness uh, program I, I discovered yeah this is this is what it is this is where the deeper deeper connection is mm-hmm. and uh, and i felt at that time wow if i could do this full time just imagine just yeah. imagine it would be play right <laughs> and and again you know signs from the, from the sky or whatever uh, and i'm very skeptical i don't even believe in the horoscope i'm a skeptical guy mm-hmm. but but i still there are things happening in the life that feels like hmm I wonder what that is. <laughs> but anyways, uh, shortly, around the same time, the, the, the company I was working with was um, uh, playing the geo strategy game, meaning like they were asking people to leave the expensive place of San Francisco to go to the less expensive place, uh, you know, in Texas or in Arizona or somewhere else. And, um, and then for the people who could not do that or didn't want to do that, Mm -hmm. they would be asked to leave the company with a little parachute so i opted for that option Mm -hmm. and uh and and i felt okay this is now never either i do like uh some other people uh at work who went straight from their job to another job Mm -hmm. not missing a bit not missing any money either or i take the risk of you know and, and 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 
and at my age it's like you know it's a big risk it's like you know you, you never uh, you don't know if you're going to find another job after that if you take a sabbatical or something so it's like um, it was it felt like a big risk but it felt like do i want to betray myself or do i want to be true to myself i know what i'm missing i know yeah. what, what i need and it's not it's not facing a screen anymore that was fine maybe for the last 20 years where i was working you know getting um, raising a family and so on but now now i want to be with people and i want to have that deep connection mm -hmm. so what do i do now so i decided to take that risk and that's where i am now i mean you know and uh, it's been uh, two and a half years almost th three years actually since i left uh, my, my job Mm -hmm. And during that time, what I have done is study more and more of uh, mindfulness and, and uh, then get, got into coaching. Uh, as I was doing my uh, mindfulness and, and trying to get more people interested in it, someone told me, hey, you know, we just had like those coaches coming to, to work and they told us about what they do. Have you looked at that? I think you'd be interested. And it's happened that we're talking about the CTI, the, the, the Proactive Training Institute. They happen to be just next door to me in San Rafael. <laughs> it's like, you know, five minutes drive from, from, where, I, from where I live. That's so again, it was like a little, you know, little something like that. I felt, hmm, I need to check that out. What's in store there for me? And I went there and, and I signed up to study the coaching with them. And again, it was mind opening. And, and again, it was like that strong connection with people that I had over there that told me, hmm, Maybe coaching is what I really want to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and uh, the mindfulness program was a little bit like coaching, but kind of like on the consulting side, telling people right. how to do something. Right. And, and coaching to me was more like, whoa, this is totally open. Discovery, finding out about the other person, uh, taking the masks off, mm -hmm. finding out who they are. And, and letting them see who you are, because you have to be vulnerable if you want the other person to be vulnerable as well. And then creating together, you know, helping them be the, the best they can be, seeing the best in themselves. I felt that was really, really amazing, being coach and, and coaching. So I said, okay, I'm signing up for this. And uh, got my certification in coaching with the Coaching Training Institute and also the ICF, the International Coaching Federation. And about that time, I got um, an email, an invitation to sign up for emotional intelligence coaching mm. but from um, Dan Goldman himself. And I felt, what? <laughs> <laughs> what is this? And, uh, and I knew it was something special. And mm -hmm. in fact, it was the first cohort ever with uh, Dan Goldman. Uh, to, to become a certified emotional intelligence coach. When I saw that, I thought I cannot pass that opportunity. I mean, this is too fabulous. I, I always knew I was interested in emotional intelligence because emotional intelligence to me is the practical application at the workplace of what you learn in mindfulness. All those techniques that we learn, the meditations and mindfulness and so on being present. If you want to put that into practice, that's called emotional intelligence. The competencies of emotional intelligence, going from self-awareness, being more aware of yourself, to empathy, being other-centered, understanding other people, to uh, adaptability, a positive outlook, gratitude, and so on. Everything is there, but it's the activation of what you know and, and putting it into, into practice in the real world. So. I signed up for that, got my certification as a, as a coach in emotional intelligence. But I don't hear, again, you know, I, as I was growing in my role of coach and uh, uh, in emotional intelligence and other things, I felt I really want to know that really, really well, because mm -hmm. this is so important. So I took a second round of it. Nice. Of the emotional intelligence coaching, but this time to coach the coaches. And nice. I became a meta coach. And, and um, I feel so good about that because I met incredible people when I, when I went to the second cohort. I did meet incredible people in the first one, but in, in the third one as well. And, and, and that extended my, my network of, of people that I look up to, people that are just incredible. 
like you, Kimberly. And um, th it's true. And, uh, and, and, and I feel like I need more people like this around me. That, that, that's, you know, that was part of the, the, my trip, like do, doing something different. And, uh, and I got that. But becoming a meta coach, now I feel like, yeah, I know the, the, the material really well. Mm -hmm. And I can coach someone so they can coach other people. So that was the step up I needed. And, uh, and I'm really proud I did that. I'm, I'm really happy I did that. So here I am today. You asked me, you know, the, the, the long story, <laughs> short, to shorten everything. I used to be an IT guy. I was, I was kind of like that, you know, uh -huh. I going to work. And now I became an emotional intelligence coach and, and uh, opening people's mind about their own possibilities. That is so cool. So, yeah, so... Again, you've already explained what you feel emotional intelligence is. And, and I love how if you break down the word emotional, the word motion is in there. Mm -hmm. And what you said was putting these practices, you know, bringing them out into the world, giving motion to your training. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so different than school book intelligence. Anybody can have school book intelligence if they apply themselves to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the emotional intelligence is just another level above because you can have someone who's very smart and very difficult to work with or mm -hmm. work for, mm -hmm. or you can have that same person you're working with or for being emotionally intelligent and boom, you know, they are here and it makes your experience mm -hmm. so much higher. So give me an example, if you would, of um, what does emotional intelligence actually look like? And it could be at home or in the workplace or, or wherever, just an example of what does it actually look like to be expressing emotional intelligence? What happens to you when you feel anger? Oh, you feel awful. You feel contracted. You mm -hmm. feel, oh, it's like a block, like you're stuck. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, we say, I am angry, right? Yes, the English language has put us in a trap because you know other languages say I feel, mm -hmm. but no, the English language mm -hmm. is I am. So yeah, you become mm -hmm. you become anger because of we how we talk. Angry. We become our feelings, and, right. and that's that's not just for uh, English speaking people. That's about just everyone. Like we we have this tendency of. Uh, identifying with our emotions, mm -hmm. even with our thoughts. Uh, it's it's uh, the hardest thing for people to realize is that we are not our thoughts. We are not our emotions. And uh, emotional intelligence is the ability to, to take a step back, to become the observer of our emotions so we can redirect the energy emotions at the base is our energy coming into the the, the, the system something inside is called homeostasis or uh, it's a mixture of a limbic brain reptilian brain notice that something is not quite right and uh, the not quite right we, we could talk about that, but, but to that system, it doesn't feel right. It feels right. like an imbalance. Right. So it has to notify you. And the way it notifies you is by giving you a lot of energy in case you need to fight or flight. It's mostly thinking about the fight or flight mode. When we get that energy, we get a change, a hormonal change inside. We get cortisol, adrenaline, and so on. And that um, gives us like a tremendous amount of energy. But the thing is, is like at the same time it does that, it also shuts down the part of our brain that can think correctly, <laughs> the PFC, right? So now we, we have a lot of energy, but we become a little bit stupider. <laughs> <laughs> and that energy wants to get out because it cannot just stay there. And, uh, and the, the reason why we, we think that we identify those emotions, I think because the energy is so incredible. It's, uh, it's like, whoa. And, um, and, and we feel the urge to, to express that energy. But we can't, right? We are at the workplace and we feel like, you know, I'm gonna punch someone, but you cannot do that, right? <laughs> and uh, you cannot do so, anything like this. And, um, 
so the, the the other thing we do is repress and then like you know go against the emotion and say okay i'm not gonna say anything and then the, the energy goes somewhere else and now we're like i don't care about anything or anybody <laughs> and 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 we go on from one thing to the next but we keep identifying with it so emotional intelligence is about like picking it up at the time it is energy in your body and realizing okay it's energy in my body the ability to recover the pfc to not let your uh, intellect shut down and uh, and 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 to be able to listen to what's going on inside so i feel the energy inside and it's a little bit crazy there's a lot of energy and my thoughts uh, are probably going in the direction of this is wrong, this is an injustice, this is not fair, that person is wrong, being on the defensive and so on. And the, th the thing here, again, is not to identify with the thoughts. Those are not your thoughts. Those are just thoughts, you know, coming in because that's the, 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 the most available to you right now. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and to say, okay, what if I replace that? What if I say, what about the circumstances? That person said such and such, but maybe they're having a, right, a hard time right now. You know, we've been like um, at home for like the last nine months, not really seeing anybody because of the pandemic and so on. Everybody's having a hard time. And uh, maybe it's even uh, extra hard for that person. Or maybe I don't really understand the whole picture. Maybe I'm missing something. And, and you can start changing your thoughts like this, create, create, create a different story. That's emotional intelligence. It's mm -hmm. when you bring back your, your own intelligence, your PFC into the picture and say, what can I do with this? Looking at your emotions, your thoughts as object that you can manipulate, that you can change so that you can change the outcome of that energy. And now that energy, instead of like going into, I need to punch someone is going to be, what can we create together? Problem being, when you're in that state, as you mentioned prior, you get stupider, <laughs> for lack yeah. of a better word, so how right? Do you, how do you recover, right? How do right. You how do you? So how do yeah. you learn emotional yeah. intelligence? Clearly, so the, the, maybe not in that moment. You can't learn it, right? Yeah. So, so emotional intelligence, emotional intelligence about learning the techniques that, that that will help you get out of that 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 that, that stage. So. And it's also creating a habit. Once you create the habit, as soon as you get the trigger, something that's gonna put you in that state, you can recognize the trigger and then you know how to, to fight it before it, gets, it goes too far and you get ready for it. So there's a long-term and a short-term. So the long-term is to do those meditation practices that you know, uh, we've learned in, in uh, the meditation school Mm -hmm. like body scan and so on that helps you being more in touch with your emotions what's going on inside so you can recognize it the other thing is a focus uh, and um, uh, awareness like focusing on your breath or on your body that creates uh, the, um, the muscles you need in your brain to let go of the incessant narrative mm -hmm. and 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 keep your focus on what you want to focus on it builds up the muscles of your PFC, of your prefrontal cortex. So it's not so easy to shut down anymore. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, so that's the long term, building, building those muscles in your mind so that it won't be uh, so easily shut down when you have a, what we call an amygdala hijack when your limbic brain takes over. Right. So let me stop you there for one second. So by long term, you mean practicing these techniques over a one week period over <laughs> no <laughs> is it nothing. is it one day a month for nine months what what sure. are we talking yeah. about <laughs> yeah so it would be like going to the gym you know for for your body mm -hmm. if you go once a month hmm, that won't make a big difference no <laughs> yeah so there's something about you know two three times a week where it, it starts making a difference where you feel better right uh, so with meditation it's kind of the same thing i don't tell people meditate like one hour a day every day uh, for most people that that would be a waste of time um i think like you know finding 10 minutes a day or 20 minutes uh, three times a week or whatever works for you but do it consistently 
just mm -hmm. like you go to the gym it's the mm -hmm. same thing the way you work on your muscles you know your body the way you work on your brain is the same so that's the long term it's yes. uh, finding this and when you stop it goes back down right uh, if we were able to to do it like for 10,000 hours in a row going to monastery for like you know two or three years it, it would become kind of permanent right and, and then we would not have to worry about losing it very quickly but if we do it only two or three times a week like i was describing it's mm -hmm. not permanent so when you stop doing it it goes away mm -hmm. so you have to continue continuously work on them but still long term because it builds up those muscles and um and the short term is the the, the little tricks so you you the first thing you do is like you, you figure out the triggers. Emotions are too fast. Once you're in it, it's too fast. The mechanism is so fast, you cannot control it. So you need to know ahead of time. That's why we tell people to collect the triggers. Mm. Things that trigger you. So a conversation with your teenager, that's going to trigger you. Okay, all right. So every time you have a conversation with your teenager, you know you're going to get triggered. So what do you do when you know a trigger is about to happen? Don't talk to them. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's that option, of course. You can leave situations. But uh, yeah. let's say you know your triggers. When you see the trigger is about to happen or has just happened, you create that space inside. Mm. <clears throat> and you've been doing mm. it. You've been training in meditation, doing that. So it's taking like longer, deeper breath and settling in like, okay, I'm here. I'm present. I'm right here. And, and, um, and that puts yourself in the place of the observer, like you're not in it, you're uh, kind of outside of it. Just like in meditation, you can observe your thoughts, the narrative mind. Mm -hmm. During the, the, uh, in that process, you put yourself kind of outside by being present and it can, it can see the, 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 the um, can feel the energy of the emotion and can hear your narrative going in a certain direction. But you're not it, you're outside of it. So now you have a little bit of control and uh, the control that you have is on your body. So you can slow down the, the, the breathing that will help you switch from uh, the fight or flight mode into the, the normal mode and keep your PFC intact, your intellect intact. And <clears throat> the other thing that you do uh, is that you, you check on the narrative and you change it. You simply change it to something that's helpful for the situation. Mm -hmm. That requires being brave. That requires um, getting out of the, you know, blaming other people and so on. You have to, to step above all this. It's, it's kind of stepping above the, the good, bad, right, wrong, binary brain and going to a place where there are more nuances, more possibilities. And once you're there, it's possible to, to, to do something about the situation. So that's the invitation. Well, recognize your trigger, breathe so you can rise above what's going on and then make sound decisions about what you want to, what story you want to tell yourself and what you're doing with your body. And there are little things like you learn, like, you know, for example, uh, you, everything is connected, like your, your body, your mind, your, your emotions. So if you can change something in your body, is going to change the way you feel and the way you think. So you have this anger coming at you. You're going to be having your fist like this. You're going to be frowning like that. You know? And uh, if, you, if you can see that coming, you can say, no, I'm going to be open. So change your position slightly. And maybe even say, I'm, I'm even going to smile. Mm -hmm. And not frown, like, you know, relax my forehead, my eyebrows. And if you do just that, it will change the way you feel. Your body is to say, wait a minute, I'm saying that signal, but I'm receiving that signal from over there. Something is wrong. Let's change right. the, the routine. And uh, yeah, so it's not, once you get the hang of it, it's not that hard. But I think the hardest thing for people is to stop identifying with their thoughts and their emotions, to realize that they are not their thoughts and their emotions. Yeah. And one of the books that we read for, it was either our first meditation, just plain meditation class or the meditation at work class that we took was one second ahead. And mm -hmm. literally what you are talking about is when you are in that fight or flight pattern, 
if you have literally just one second between your actions that you used to always do, your go-to actions, if you have one second between your action and your reaction, sorry, I'm, I switched that up. If you have one section between how you would normally react, mm -hmm. like, you know, a monster, let's say, <laughs> mm -hmm. and give yourself one second to think, step back and then act, it, it changes everything. And it confuses the other people that are used to you being a crazy lunatic mm -hmm. when they see you not react that way and you take a moment and you pause and then you act in a different way, they can't help but shift how they react back to you because you're not giving them the same triggers. It's, mm -hmm. it's a magical one second of everybody read the book one second ahead. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> was my fave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's, it is that simple. When you think of it, it's not complicated. If you can create that space, you'll be ahead of the game. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So for leaders in business, because I know you go into the workplace, we'll, we'll talk about a couple other offerings you have, but when you go into the workplace and you work with leaders, why is this whole focus on emotional intelligence so important for them and for their team members and for their home life or everything? What, what, what does this do for your leaders? So you have to understand that emotional intelligence is not, uh, be just being intelligent about our emotions, like in doing, uh, you know, whether you're in fear and anger or whatever, notice, noticing this and changing that. Uh, it's really a set of skills, a set of competencies that are really important for the workplace. And uh, some of them, uh, they, they, they've done some studies, some, some um, polls, and, and they found out that um, self-awareness, for example, is the most important. If you don't have self-awareness, there is a big discrepancy between how you see yourself and how other people see you. Now, imagine being a boss, a leader, and you think you're doing really well, that you are very generous, empathic, uh, that you give everybody a fair chance and so on, and that they see you not like that, but mm -hmm. the opposite. They have a totally different picture of you. You're not nice. They don't trust you. They, they, you know, and this happens because of a lack of self-awareness. Absolutely. So self-awareness is kind of, it can be a humbling factor for some people. It requires some humility to go there, to realize, oops, you know, it's like, um, I forgot, I think it was a phrase from Shakespeare, right? It says, <clears throat> in sleep, a king, but awake, no such thing. And now, uh, <laughs> As long as you don't know, you're not aware, you can think you're a king, but when you wake up, it's like, oops, maybe not. <laughs> so self-awareness is, is, is like um, managing that gap between who you think you are and, and what people see in real life. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the more you become self-aware, the closer you are to that picture. Good and bad. I mean, you know, some people really um, don't realize how good they are with others and, and in what they do and they don't trust themselves. And it's also a lack of self-awareness. So there is that, so that's the most important skill. And then after that, there is the emotional control. We just talked about that, by mm -hmm. being able to manage your emotion. And usually when people think about emotional intelligence, that's what they think about, emotional control. Mm -hmm. But that's just one competency, an important mm -hmm. one, but just one. And the other ones after that are uh, adaptability and uh, positive outlook. And adaptability, after self-awareness is one of the most important competency at the workplace. The workplace today, especially for knowledge workers, is all about change. Things are changing all the time. It's always in flux. Mm -hmm. And uh, you need to be adaptable. And uh, it's part of emotional intelligence. So when you study emotional intelligence, you study how to be more adaptable. One of the key things about adaptability is to be able to entertain other people's ideas and uh, we see that in IT some people are very bright very intelligent but it's my way or the highway right <laughs> and then when you try to to give them a different way of doing something it's like it gets very defensive right 
And uh, so adaptivity is learning that, learning how to open your mind and see other possibilities, um, to listen more to other people and their ideas and incorporate them into your own thinking. So very important skill. A positive outlook is about uh, finding the, not just finding the silver lining, but learning from your failures. Mm -hmm. It's inevitable that we're gonna fail. And uh, we have all these things about uh, the, 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 lean, um, the lean enterprise and yes. um, agile also in IT and, and DevOps and so on. All that is about failing fast. So you can learn and go back and, 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 and do the right thing. But it's, it doesn't work for, the, for, for someone who doesn't have a positive outlook. Positive outlook is really resilience, is to see like, I'm okay with failing, I'm gonna learn from it and it's gonna get better. And, and I see you know, what works, what doesn't work. It's not fooling yourself that the, the, everything is pink and beautiful and all that, but it's focusing on what works and what can work as opposed to focusing on what doesn't work and maybe go into the, the blaming game, blaming yourself and other people. Hmm. So and you go from have, failing fast to failing well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And learning especially. Yeah. The other thing is like, if you don't take risk, you don't learn, you right. don't get better. So how many projects at work, you know, get stuck because people are planning to death when they should be like running fast and not being afraid of failure. Right. And uh, so the other one is achievement orientation. Achievement orientation used to be motivation drivers. Mm. And that's uh, very important for, for oneself to know your purpose, what you're about and uh, what motivates you. Because you want to get, um, if you want to get ahead in your career, you need to do the things that matter for you. If you start doing th something that you don't enjoy, enjoy then it's not going to last very long. Then you get not stress because of anxiety, but you get to depress because of boredom, which right. is not really there. If you want to be in the flow, it's in between. It's like not too anxious that you get overwhelmed. So you need the right challenge, but not to the point where you get bored. So following your purpose, what really motivates you and getting the right challenges from your boss, from the people you work with, that's what puts you in the flow. And that's what achievement orientation is about. And then after that, we have the uh, social awareness and, and um, that's about empathy. Now, empathy is an interesting one. A lot of people uh, I meet think that they have a lot of empathy. And the way they describe it to me is like, I help a lot of people. I was helping others and mm -hmm. nobody helps me. Mm -hmm. Those who complain at the end of it. And also they say that they are drained by empathy. Like I'm helping so much other people that I feel drained. I don't have any energy left. For yourself, then, yeah. So that's, that's what I see out there when people describe empathy, but that's not it. That's not the, the empathy we're talking about. The empathy we're talking about is really uh, being aware of what other people feel. Hmm. Maybe acting on it. There are three kinds of uh, empathy. This is a cognitive empathy where you understand how people feel using your logic. I understand that, you know, you had to move to a different place and that you have a new job and a new boss. So therefore it must be difficult for you. That's cognitive empathy. I'm being logical. There is emotional empathy. We're together and I see your body language. I see your facial expression and I feel something is amiss. Something is not right. And I can almost feel it inside. Mm. Wow. What happened today? You know, what's going on? And uh, there is the uh, compassion. So uh, co uh, empathy with concern, like caring about someone to the point where you're gonna act on it, you're gonna do something about it. And, um, and it's a choice, you know, where you want to go. Sometimes it's better to stay in connective empathy because if you go into the emotional empathy, you're gonna be dragged down. Right. If someone has something really tough happening to them, really difficult, you probably want to stay in the cognitive empathy so you can continue to function and help them. Because if you go into the emotional, that's when you get drained, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and same thing with the, the, the compassion, the concern. Uh, it's about what you can do to help someone 
But if you end up like doing something for a lot of people, then you're not really doing anything for anybody. So you have to, to make some, some choices and uh, on what, what, you know, how you want to spend your compassion because you have a limited amount, a limited amount of time, a limited amount of that energy. So empathy is really like starting to, to go from self-centered to other-centered and it manifests itself, especially in listening. So when you are with someone and you lack the empathy skill, when they talk to you, you're going to think about your own things. Sometimes you just even discard everything they say and think about your own problems, like my next meeting and what did I have for lunch? And you don't even listen to them, right? And you go like this while they're talking, but you're not listening. Uh, another thing is you listen to them, but you interrupt them to tell them about your own experience. Right. Or you wait for them to be finished so you can say something. And when you do that, again, you're not really listening to them. You don't really care about them. It's about you, how you can help, not about them. Mm -hmm. And empathy in listening is really about them. It's being other-centered. So now you listen to them and you ask questions. You're being curious. Wow, really? This is what happened? Tell me more about it. What else? And you really listen and you are with them. And uh, to the level where you can you know, even read their facial expression, their body language, and so on, and take it all in and, uh, and, and ask open-ended questions to give them a chance to tell you even more because it's about them, about them to being heard and being seen and you providing that for them, being their witness. That's, wh that's where empathy manifests itself, especially at work. And um, the other skill, social uh, organizational awareness, is when you, you, you bring your awareness, the, 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 the self-awareness, awareness of others, to another scale where you, you're able to, to be aware of the organization itself. Mm. Uh, each organization, each company has its own culture. There is a written culture, what, what you find that's written on their website, like, you know, how they want you to behave and so on, the, the goals and, and so on. And then there is the unwritten culture what people really do, what they really think, and how they really behave. And so you have to become aware of that. You have to become aware of who are the real influencers, who are the people who can really make a difference. Because at work, if you really want to make a difference yourself, you need to know who you need to influence in order to get your project done, in order to, to get people interested in your vision. There are so many bright people with lots of ideas, especially in IT, right? Mm -hmm. They have brilliant ideas. And, um, but people are not interested in listening to them. And, uh, and nothing happens with their ideas. And they get frustrated and they leave their job or, or keep complaining about it. The thing is, is they haven't developed their organizational awareness and their influencing skills. If they could develop that, they would know that in order for people to listen to them, to get their vision, people interested in the vision, they have to convince the right people. But to convince the right people, you have also to have some empathy. You have to have a connection, a bond with them. So everything gets connected. And that's how we get to the relationship skills. So when we get to influencing, inspiration, inspirational leadership, coaching and mentoring, teamwork, and conflict management, you need to have the basic skills we just talked about. Empathy, um, adaptability, positive outlook, self-awareness, emotional control. Once you have that, then you can manifest the other skills. And of course, you learn about the other skills as well in emotional intelligence, how to uh, use those skills. So that's why emotional intelligence is so important at the workplace. It's not just emotional control, that'd be too easy. And that's what most people talk about. It's all the other skills that are so important at the workplace to be able to influence people to inspire others, to, to resolve conflicts. That's what and we're talking about. To the improve moment. the culture. To improve the culture. Yeah. So Tony, I'm sure that every leader who is watching this video is saying, where can I find him? Where can I find this man? Where's Tony Sicardi? So uh, how can people find you and work with you? The best is uh, to connect with me on LinkedIn. 
and uh, or to go to my website. If you go to my website, you will have uh, some links where you can uh, even schedule a meeting with me and we can have a one-to-one -one conversation. You can tell me about what you want to create uh, at your own workplace. And, um, and we can you know, work together and figure out the best way to, to present to your boss what we could do together, well, how we could uh, implement emotional intelligence at the workplace. Uh, I do uh, coaching one-on-one, -on -one, but, uh, and I use the best material. So the material I use is the one that was created by Dan Goldman and his team. And uh, it's uh, 12 weeks uh, engagement. For 12 weeks, you learn something new every day. And, uh, and I help you with the coaching. So you have a self-assessment, 12 weeks program and coaching on top of that. With that, I can guarantee you that your emotional intelligence is gonna improve. Improve to the point where it's gonna make uh, a real difference uh, in your life and at the workplace especially. Uh, so yeah, if you want to connect with me, go to my website. And if you're brave enough, schedule a one-on-one -on -one with me. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Well, Tony, honestly, you, you gave so much information and I, that, that people can use already. And I thank you so very much for joining us today. I treasure all of your insights and your wisdom. And it has just been a complete information fest for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Kimberly, you're welcome. Thank you so much for inviting me today. Can I have you back another time to talk some more about the subject or another subject? I can talk endlessly about this subject. <laughs> so the answer is yes. It will be my Beautiful. <laughs> and to everyone watching, we hope that you have enjoyed this episode of the Happiness Retreat. We hope that you have gotten some inspiration, some motivation, some clarity, and some guidance in your connection with your own soul and becoming the master of your own energy. So Tony, thank you again. And until next time, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>